Fighting games are one of my absolute favorite genres of video game. The ability for players to express themselves through character choice and movement alone is absolutely unparalleled. With different players of different mains taking the same character they both love in different directions. The high-speed chess-like mind games of reading your opponent, adjusting to their playstyle, trying to lure them into traps and executing an incredibly hype combo are utterly intoxicating. And few things feel better than getting to gloat after landing a well-timed, inescapable super move. Are you okay? Best the whole genre features some of the most fun, competitive, and skill-driven interactions imaginable, and I barely know that joy because I am very, very bad at them. Get serious! I just haven't trained my brain to really master the split-second decision-making that works in tandem with situational awareness that high-level fighting gameplay requires. I know what I want to do in matchups on paper, but I flounder when put in disadvantage, usually pick characters who suck while in disadvantage, and just don't have the execution prowess to make up for that deficiency. Or, more than likely, to stop spamming DP on Wake Up. Predictable! But I do sincerely love watching the genre, learning the stories of fighters, seeing their worlds develop from nothing more than character designs and cool combat functions into... Football! Is going to save the world! So I'm always on the lookout for ways that fighting games bridge that gap between mashing buttons at your local arcade and the level of too good for your friends, but not good enough to escape pools in a tournament. There have been some excellent training modes over the years, the advent of auto combo strings to create one safe option for players to eventually branch off of, and even characters like the Smash Brothers interpretations of Ryu and Terry that transcend their game's inherent system to teach fighting game fundamentals. And I find all of it incredibly welcoming. However, what I didn't expect is that the answer to the question of where do I even start with fighting games? Might be the simplest. At the very beginning. Games about one-on-one -on -one combat existed before Street Fighter 2, but the classic fighting game as we know it would not exist without the World Warrior. While previous Versus fighters had identical playable characters, Street Fighter II featured a whopping seven unique playable characters and a homeless man for players to duke it out with, each with wildly different playstyles and designs. Players could gravitate toward the burly Soviet suplex machine Zangief, or the tricky extendo arms of the guru Dalsim, or the heroic man beast Blanca discover which of them gelled the best with their own playstyle and preferences, and also whichever one they could figure out the special moves for. However, the freedom that this number of characters and the system Street Fighter 2 was built on allowed came with its own problems. Could players really improve on beating each other up with so many options? Obviously, innovation and creativity will happen with a game like SF2, but how do you get players to explore that without just relying on a dominant strategy? If the meta doesn't develop past two kids mashing Honda's hundred hand slap until one wins, what can you do? Well, that's where what we now know today as the arcade mode comes in. Street Fighter 2 lets players take on a full gauntlet of all seven characters they didn't choose. This does a great job in showing off all the possible special moves that each character has access to, and opens up the mind to possibilities of how to use them. However, it's what the game does after this seven-man set that really impresses me. For after you conquer seven other world warriors, who should descend upon you but the four heavenly kings of Shadaloo? These four boss characters were not playable in SF2's original release, and are just built different, overwhelming players with an assault of new techniques and pure, raw power. 
Unlike the rest of the playable cast, these guys are built like the arcade bosses of old. Just plain unfair to fight sometimes. But it's their presence and inclusion that takes your average Street Fighter 2 newbie and pushes them into really understanding the game's deeper mechanics. The Four Kings can't be overcome by just hitting special moves and praying. They require application of when to use those moves, of learning their habits, of finding the best way to exploit their weaknesses. In facing down these four bosses, you don't just play Street Fighter, you master it. USA! Up first is Las Vegas' ultimate prize fighter and the muscle of the Four Kings, Balrog. Obviously modeled after vicious boxer and video game mega boss Mike Tyson, to the point of being named Mike Bison in Japan, Balrog's claim to fame is his overwhelming power. His punches, later famed for killing elephants in just one strike, are incredibly meaty, dealing a huge amount of damage even if the player is guarding. His strongest special move is the Turn Punch, an incredibly cocky maneuver where he puts all of his weight into a single straight, able to take away half of even Zangief's life bar with its bewildering might. And on top of that incredible strength, Balrog keeps his guard tight, playing optimally by holding back and blocking due to his status as a charge character. Charge characters, as the name implies, require the character to charge up moves, holding a direction on the joystick for at least a second or so before releasing it in the opposite direction typically making them very defensive, opportunistic characters looking to abuse openings. To this point, the players fought with four charge characters, and the three of them with actually decent charge moves, Guile, Blanca, and E. Honda, followed the idea of turtling to a T. They're content to just flash kick and hundred hand slap when the player gets into their range, and toss out a sonic boom or magic flying spin dash to get the player into that range. Balrog takes a look at this incredibly defensive style, laughs right in its face, and weaponizes it into an all-out offensive. His signature move is the Dash Straight, a punch that carries him across the screen in an instant, far faster than anything Honda could manage, and with far less end lag than a Blanca Ball. Add in the sheer reach of his standing heavy punch, and Rog can unleash a fury of blows that'll leave you dazed and bloodied in a split second. And if a player tries jumping, Balrog can turn his straight into an uppercut, leaving a guarding player in the same position, in the corner, on the ground, and knock silly by the raging buffalo. Balrog is the basic mechanics of Street Fighter II sharpened into the most deadly blade, a sudden rush of attacks built to overwhelm, dizzy, and destroy. I am in the presence of a maestro! Well done, Balrog! But of all of Shadaloo's heavenly kings, Balrog is definitely the one that's the most down-to-earth. For all of his mastery of the fundamentals, he has two very key weaknesses. The most obvious is that the man lacks a projectile of any kind. This isn't necessarily an immediate problem. Balrog's naturally going to be blocking to charge up his dashes, and his jump is low to the ground so he can bounce over most fireballs pretty easily. But it does mean that Balrog can't dictate the pace of most matches. He has to wait for the player to screw up and punish their careless fireball spam, or else he's going to charge right into a flame. And secondly, Balrog might have a lot of fantastic tools for hitting the player straight on, but if they're ducking, his moveset is exceptionally limited. There are three different heights for attacks in Street Fighter 2. High, medium, and low. Blocking guards against two of these types of attacks. High and middle if you're standing upright, and middle and low if you're crouching. Balrog is brilliant at bringing in the body blows, but his moves that hit overhead are supremely lacking, defaulting to a very predictable jumping downward punch. 
Additionally, his dash upper completely whiffs against crouching opponents, leaving his legs wide open as he swings at nothing but air. By exploiting these two weaknesses, the player forces Balrog to play the game at their own pace, not letting him get the chance to overwhelm unless they get careless. In this way, Balrog serves as a test that the players have a grasp on the fundamentals of Street Fighter 2. How to block, when to block, when to use special moves, the differences between various kinds of attacks, and how to keep cool under pressure. Keep this in mind, and players can cash out of the Golden Nugget Casino with two rounds and one bloodied boxer in the bank. But fight money! You win! So Balrog was a fun fight. He might be tricky at first due to sheer damage output and the reach of his punches, but once you know what you're doing, he's a nice fair battle to show your knowledge of the fundamentals in. But once you take your trip to Barcelona, you're locked in a cage with the violent narcissist, Vega. And this man is a disgusting, filthy cheater, man. I hate him! Olay, olay. Everything about Vega is meant to utterly overwhelm the player, most obvious being the three-bladed claw worn on his arm. No other member of Street Fighter II's cast uses a weapon, and as you'd expect, that thing gives him a ridiculous amount of range. He has the same wall kick maneuver that Chun-Li has, but with unparalleled speed, giving him the highest and fastest jumps in the game. This is coupled with his incredibly disjointed dive kick, which... I mean, look at them games! How's Zangief supposed to counter that, my little borscht baby boobala? Not bad, comrade! He's got Dalsim's slide kick, but faster, meaning that he can hit low and get in close simultaneously to rack up serious damage. He's got a backflip, which is completely immune to projectiles and puts him at the perfect range to bounce around and kick you from. Oh, and if he happens to be down in health a bit, he can leap into the background, something that no other character, boss or no, can do, and take a breather on the cage wall, leaping back with his lethal flying Barcelona attack whenever he feels like it. Oh, but say you get wise to his tricks, try to play defensively, He's got no qualms of using his incredible mobility to get in close for a throw. Or even worse, if you try to block the Flying Barcelona, Vega can fake the player out and pierce their guard with an Izuna drop, putting them in an even worse position for trying to play it safe. And the worst part of it all is, while the Matador is leaping around, chilling out in the background, ducking out of the player's reach, the timer is still ticking down. Play too defensively, and Vega will easily take a timeout win, pressuring the player to play more aggressively, make more mistakes, and fall to his blade. Vega is a perfect matador, playing lame and winning games, goading the player into acting the part of the raging bull for him to elegantly slay, and he'll gladly do so again and again and again. Too late. You're mine now. What seduces me more? The crimson of fresh blood, or the scream of death? <laughs> Yet, in spite of Vega's overwhelming speed, reach, metagaming, and power, he does possess a fatal weakness. His fragility. Vega is so ridiculously full of himself that he's never allowed his beautiful face to receive even the slightest scratch. And that is fully reflected in his design as a fighter. Unlike the rest of the Four Kings, Vega's damage scaling is poor, meaning that he's going to be taking as much damage as possible from any given attack. Additionally, while he's throwing out all of these moves, Vega doesn't really want to be taking the brunt of any hits from a player or going on the defensive himself. After taking eight hits, blocked or no, Vega has a small chance of dropping his claw, unable to pick it back up and losing that massive range advantage he once had. With these two facts in mind, the player knows exactly what Vega wants to do. Hold back to let his opponent make the first move, punish them for it, and dance around his weaknesses with safe kicks and swipes. 
and knowing that, they could make him suffer for it. By turning the match around on Vega and making the bullfighter into the bull, the player can utterly humiliate the masked matador. Vega may have a superior dive kick, but that doesn't matter if he kicks first or overshoots. Running directly into an anti-air maneuver or your own delayed drop kick. If he's on the ground, he's not where he wants to be. Trying to charge up his rolling crystal flash to dance forward or looking for an opportunity to perform a sliding kick. Pressuring him with a projectile or longer ranged move will force him to block and get him closer to losing his signature claw at best or eating full damage at worst. Slaying the armed assassin is a matter of preventing him from playing his game, ducking in and out of his range to tempt him to strike, and punishing him for the weaknesses he can't hide with his acrobatics. In this way, Vega is a nasty check that players have learned the elements of footsies, the mind game of feeling out your opponent's range and striking with your own safest options. And once players have learned this dance, they can leave their arrogant ballroom partner behind and look to take on Shadaloo's number two. You win! Thailand! Up next is the King of Muay Thai. Tiger! The, the final boss of the first Street Fighter, back for revenge. Tiger! The second in command of Shadow. Tiger! Oh, would you freaking stop? Tiger! 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 Uppercut! Sagat. <laughs> There's no real subtlety to Sagat. From the moment the player is pitted against him, they know what they're in for. An utter barrage of projectiles. Sagat's Tiger Shot is the fastest projectile in the game, both in speed and how quickly he can dish out another one. If the player tries to throw out their own fireball, Sagat can nullify it without a second thought, and probably throw in a chaser for good measure. Attempt to bounce over the fire and strike from above, and Sagat will unleash the Tiger Uppercut, one of the strongest single hits in the game that's sure to send anyone it connects with flying. Really? Sagat could coast by on just those two moves, peppering opponents from full screen, but he's a warrior through and through, and will allow you to face him in glorious combat. Sagat uses his tiger shots to lure you into a corner, then approaches, using his massive limbs to deal crushing blows whenever possible, looking for just the right opportunity to get that uppercut in and send the player packing. Sagat's toolkit is pretty much just Ryu's and Ken's, but better in every conceivable way. Sagat is better than you in every way at a base level. How do you even overcome the Shoto style in this perfect form? That's the best you can do! <laughs> well, by exploiting the habits of the player, of course. First and foremost, Sagat's obviously the final exam on how to deal with projectiles, and players can figure out his pattern pretty well. Sagat may have the fastest flames in all of Thailand, but that means those fireballs leave the screen quicker too. He still suffers quite a hefty bit of end lag after tossing one out, so figuring out his rhythm will let players hop over and approach pretty easily if he's spamming. The Muay Thai Master too committed to his flames to uppercut them into oblivion. On top of that, Sagat is such a lanky lad that all of his standing fireballs will pass right over the heads of all but two street fighters if they're crouching, creating a safe haven and some breathing room to wait and see what Sagat's next move will be. But the real kicker is Sagat's fatal weakness, his honor. Perhaps he considers himself too good for such a move, Perhaps he's afraid of being banned from his local arcade for cheap tactics, but no matter how much you hold back and block against him, Sagat will never throw the player in Street Fighter 2. He demands a true battle, one of fists, feet, and flames. And should you be more than happy to oblige him, Sagat can only truly make a player suffer if they make a mistake. 
While his options come out fast, his specials especially leave him vulnerable to counters, creating openings for the patient player. Take advantage of this, pick your shots wisely, and keep a cool head, and nothing will stand between you and your final challenger. You came from across the world to fight me, soldier. Now is your chance. <laughs> Pathetic. Geese Howard. Justice. Rugal Bernstein. Akuma. Ivan Ooze. Names that can make skin crawl and tempers flare. Abusers of their game's mechanics. Powerhouses without remorse. And all assuredly worthy of the term final boss. These are figures that have come to define just how hard and cruel fighting game bosses can truly be, how overwhelming their pressure and options are, and how satisfying beating a cheap AI at its own game can feel. But these deities of fighting games were born of a progenitor, an unpredictable madman who could take lives in an instant who was utterly unfair to battle, who commanded absolute respect. They were born of the highest deva, the head of Shadaloo, the final boss of Street Fighter II. All arrive and all bow before the might of M. Bison. Oh, this is delicious! Bison isn't just everything you've learned wrapped into one final showdown. He's better than it. You can start around perfectly fine, and then BAM! Scissor kick directly to the face. Not only can this move hit medium and low, one right after the other, not only can Bison act immediately out of it, not only does it push you into the corner, but if it hits, it can instantly put a player into a dizzy state and Bison can combo it into itself. If he wanted to, Bison could just kick the player forever, trapped in a purgatory of knees and heels until their bodies give out. It's only by his pity and mercy that they're allowed to survive. But one busted move isn't enough for Bison. Oh no, he's got a full move set to terrorize with. At any point, Bison can launch himself into the air and stomp directly onto the head of his foe, homing in on their exact location for the most violent Goomba stomp he can manage. This move does have obvious startup, but if it hits, Bison can follow it up with a second, unique diving punch to really put the hurt on the player. But if it's blocked, <laughs> no problem. Bison's able to use the momentum to leapfrog off of his opponent's shoulders and soar to the other side of the screen, throwing out a kick to cover his escape and make it completely safe. This dictator has diplomatic immunity to being trapped in the corner and can get out with a leap whenever he wants, ruining any advantage that a pressuring player had. He's got the Vega slide, but even safer and faster due to the natural pressure that the scissor kick gives off, as well as its ability to combo right out of his psycho-powered jabs. Honor? <laughs> That's for losers who are slaves to the concept. So unlike Sagat, Bison has no trouble throwing the player and melting their life bar if they play too defensively. And if he feels truly challenged, he can unleash his ultimate move, the Psycho Crusher. My psycho power knows no limits! A lethal, full-screen body spear that not only does massive damage, not only burns players hit by it and forces them into a tripping state, not only outprioritizes all other physical moves, but can actually pass through a fighter, making retribution as Bison appears behind them nothing personnel kid incredibly difficult. And considering how quickly he can turn that cross up into a scissor kick, a throw, or a second Psycho Crusher, it makes an already intimidating move a nearly hopeless scenario. This place shall become your grave! 
M. Bison is Street Fighter 2 pushed to its logical limit. The fundamental features of the game being turned up to 11 and weaponized to utterly overwhelm and humble. Fighting Bison isn't fair, and there'll be times that he acts in a way where no matter how hard they try, the player cannot win. The world is his plaything, and the player is just one more insignificant ant to crush in his wake. Yes! Yes! You lose! If M. Bison represents anything, it's that there is always someone better than you. There will always be someone who's got better reactions, more consistency, who can play the game better, who will throw something out that you have no idea how to handle. It's like the man himself says, you cannot compare to Bison's power. But you can keep trying. You can keep improving. And at the hardest challenge, more than a few dollars worth of quarters down, you can overcome it. In spite of everything, Bison has his weaknesses. His unpredictable movements can be exploited by quick reactions. Aerials or fireballs thrown out to catch his landings able to stuff out jumps. If you guard against the scissor kick, the move does zero block damage, making waiting out the storm for your perfect opportunity incredibly possible. Unlike the rest of his moves, the Psycho Crusher has a distinct startup window, making stopping it with a fireball incredibly easy, and jumping over it to prevent Bison's deadly grab mix-up very possible. When blocking low, Bison needs to jump kick or head stomp in order to hit the player, meaning that an approaching Bison can be chipped at by low sweeps. It's never a guaranteed win. Sometimes it's a fluke, Sometimes it's a heartbreaking defeat. But with every round, you're learning your opponent's weaknesses. You're growing. And when you become not the strongest character, but the better fighter, Bison will fall. And the strongest warrior in the world will be you. No! You win! Perfect. Defeating M. Bison is far from the end of the road. There's no guarantee you can beat him or any of the Four Kings easily again. There will be new challengers, ready to use the original eight world warriors in ways you've never thought of or optimized to an insane degree. New versions of Street Fighter 2 and other fighting games came out like clockwork adding even further wrinkles, new possibilities, new systems. The fight will be eternal, and felling the four heavenly kings is just the first step. But Balrog, Vega, Sagat, and M. Bison, when fought together, create a love for fighting games and the systems they operate on that make all future challenges something to look forward to. Every sensibility is challenged. Blocking, throwing, anti-air, mind games, zoning, anti-zoning, and most importantly of all, learning and growing. Through their struggles against Shadaloo, players learn all of these techniques, and then can apply them in matches against friends, picking up on their own patterns and habits, tossing out Hadoukens with confidence where they faltered before, and always looking for the next fight to learn something new and hone their techniques further. Fighting game culture developed from this slow push to get better. The joy of winning battles of inches, the desire to feel comfortable in any and all scenarios so you can pull off the same soul-stealing maneuvers that were used against you once upon a time to humble someone else. And it's fantastic. The Four Kings were able to create that test, that initial push that their arcade brethren thrived off of, and then let their students have at it, and become competitors to far exceed their limitations. If you've ever wanted to dive into fighters, or just want to revisit what makes them great, I implore you to set off against Shadaloo with the hope of taking M. Bison down. 
because though the path is long and treacherous, the heart of battle is etched into every button press. The four kings are waiting to teach you how to design for mastery. Here comes a new challenger!